Well, I just watched Pulau. I didn't even pay for it. I still want my money back. Hey everybody, I'm Sita Jodev, your movie buddy, and today I'm going to be talking about Pulau. This is definitely a spoiler review. If you don't want me to spoil it for you, come back and watch it later. Pulau is a Malay language Malaysian film directed by Iho. I think that's how you say his name. The story is about a group of friends who we don't know who they are or how they know each other. Like, are they school friends, college friends, work friends? No context provided whatsoever. But they are a group of friends who goes on a vacation together to some random island. Again, no context provided as in where they're going, when they're going, why are they even going to this island? Here you meet Kat played by Amelia Henderson, Kai played by Iqmal Amri, Lily played by Joey Leong, Yus played by Sanjana Suri, and Daos played by Jasmine Juma, Mark played by Vikar, and Ben played by Ali Satar. Namron playing Azhan, the boat owner, takes them to an island where these characters, again out of nowhere, meet their rivals there. We meet Haris Anwar leading another four to five characters, which honestly, I don't know why they even exist in this film. Who are these rivals? What is the issue? What is the common problem? Do they know each other? We have no idea. Honestly, it felt like some high school kids gang issues. Like, you know, those kids standing at canteen, like two rivals, they're like, Oi, go up her, huh? Go up her. It was that kind of rival. I'm not kidding. So since we introduced rivalry in the script, now we must have a competition to show which team is better than the other. In Pulau, a group of grown-ups decided to bet <sighs> on a dance-off battle doing Tarian Bulo or Tarian Magunate. You know, like the t -t 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 at the beach. This is officially where I started losing my shit. Now, during this exciting dance of battle, which you don't give a f about, while Amelia Henderson dancing her way, she suddenly got these images of some random deserted island and something really happened in the past, like some tragedy and whatnot. So she loses balance and then obviously she'll lose the bet. So now the loser's team, which is Amelia's team, have to spend a night at some deserted island, which was earlier warned my Namron to not go there because the island is deserted for some, for that something really bad happened there. But you already know what happened there because of the trailer. Yeah. So the rest of the story is about these dumb grown-ups making dumb choices at this dumb island. Now the film started really well, I'm not gonna lie. You know, you, you are introduced to this montage sequence of the flashback of what happened at this island. You know, people are running, screaming, crying, and then you hear someone, someone cursing the island. And then you see, they, they show you the film title, Pulau. I thought, okay, that's a strong opening. They must go somewhere with it. From there, they just went downhill. Now, to begin with, the dialogue. See, everything and everything they say in this film sounds so scripted and forced. Nothing feels natural. For example, there's this one scene where Sanjana Suri tries to negotiate with the ghost when the ghost is going to kill her. She's like, Maafkan kami, kami tak sengaja. What, what, whooping ipi shit is going on here? What? Listen, a quick thought. Maybe you should have made this film in English. Maybe it would have not been that cringy. You know, with dialogues like, eh, Panda eh, Kopili Resort? Of course. Hi, class. We stopped writing dialogues like that back in 90s. <laughs> Alif Sata's character tries to break the ice with Emilia's character by saying, Muka you macam deserted island. Deserted island? Uh-uh, Sunni. Bro, who wrote these lines? But the bigger problem with Pulau is not that. It's the direction, it's the screenplay, and it's the acting. In other words, everything. The bad writing in this film is so obvious, I'm gonna take my time to make my case here. Bear with me. You get to see Emilia Henderson playing Cat, who has six cents where she can see ghosts but it doesn't stop there. She sees random spirit. She travels to the past. She digs a grave to touch a skull to find out what happened to that person when they were alive. She talks to the ghost. She negotiates with the ghost. She even argues with the ghost. I'm not kidding. There was a scene where the ghost talks to Amelia and the ghost says, Aku buat semuanya untuk anak aku. And Amelia says, Tapi, come on, come on, say much money. And then the ghost says something else and Amelia argues. I'm like, Bro, we were told in the past that someone, a really powerful tantric, literally killed himself trying to control this ghost. And here we see Amelia having heart-to-heart -heart dialogues with this ghost. Question is, how powerful is Amelia's character? We have no idea. And then we have Ben, played by Alif Sata, who is not a part of this group of friends, but he is a cousin of one of this friend who decided to join the trip because he's carrying some heavy feelings. And later on, we were told that this heavy feeling is all about him losing his mother to COVID-19. So now he's here, sad about it, crying about it. The question is, why do we have this guy crying about his mother at this pulau out of nowhere? Is it relevant to the storytelling? We have no idea. And then we have Kai, played by Iqmal Amri, whose sole purpose in this film is to give an ugly looking bracelet to Emilia's character, which my grandmother would obviously refuse to wear it, and express his love towards her. But he struggles to do it. 
here's a tip, Kai. Why don't you just walk up to her and say, hey, cat, I saw this and I thought of you. Hope you like it. But no, we have to keep stretching the unnecessary bracelet thing. There are so many scenes and conversations about this bracelet in this scene. He even goes on to say things like, Kalau lelaki pakai kan gelang ni kat tangan perempuan, mereka selama-lamanya tak akan berpisah. Off. Now the problem is you're not really invested in the story because you don't know who the f*** these people are. Who is Kai? Who is Kai? Do they know each other? Do they not know each other? Where they met? Like you have no f***ing idea who these people are. So when the makers are trying to make this romance happen, right, you don't really give a flying about it. He also has a thing against Alev Sata's character because he feels like Emilia is getting closer to him. So there's also a weird love triangle tension happening all the time in the film where Emilia do get the scene where she split fight between two guys, you know, where they normally go, guys, stop it, stop it. Noah, look at me. You're better than this. <laughs> she didn't say it, but that scene exists. Why do we have a love triangle here? Lily, played by Joey Leong, who I think is an influencer in this film because she occasionally, maybe four times in the film, goes on to record the holiday progress. She's like, hi guys, we are sleeping at the deserted island tonight. Hi guys, uh, they look at the environment after COVID, everything is booming. Okay, first of all, who is she? What is she doing? Where is this video going? Why is she even an influencer? Like, how is this relevant to the storytelling? We have no idea. Now here comes my favorite character, Dawood. <laughs> <laughs> Dawus, played by Jasmine Juma, who acts like a rumpet from Shah Alam. Sole purpose in this film is to sleep around, and he does. He goes on to say things like, Malam ni nothing about a fly ka. Lea, shao shao Hello, police. Uh, Dawus, cringy as fuck. You know, when he got killed in the film, I started clapping, bitch. I'm not even kidding you. I'm not even kidding you. <laughs> but the question is, why we needed this acha acha toxic character in this film? We have no idea. Yuse, played by Sanjana Suri. I still don't understand why they decided to call her Yuse, like she used to be Yusri or something. She's like this really high class Damansara girls, you know, who's like makeup and hair is always on point and they're doing bare minimum, like, Jom, pagi mandi? Jom, pagi swimming pool? Like, bro, why do we need this, this pretty looking girl saying this one liner in this film? We have no idea. Mark, played by Vikar, is basically every African-American character in every Hollywood film who's there just for comic relief. Unfortunately, nothing said or done here is funny. He goes on to say lines like, Jom kita gara? Do I have a choice? Which is not funny, but you're like, what? He was so not relevant to the film that at one point he disappears and nobody talks about him. They didn't try to look for him, like nobody mentioned about him again. But then, the only Indian guy goes missing, but nobody talks about him. Are we making a political statement here? I don't know. But the bigger question is, why was he in this film? We have no idea. Desmond, played by Haris Anwar, is by far the character that I hated the most in the film. He was just playing a high school bully in every American teen drama. You know, he's just there saying mean stuff and, you know, making mockery of other people. He's like, oh, tomorrow I'll come to pick up your dead body. See, the characters here, they're clearly old, but they keep acting like they're 12 year old. And Haris Anwar is so prominent at playing 12 year old. Oh, Miss Pui was also in this film. See, we need to talk about this. When this film received a lot of backlash due to sex scenes and, you know, uh, due to skin shows, I was one of them supporting the film because I don't believe in censorship. You know, I believe that if the said scenes are necessary for the storytelling, even if it's explicit, you should have it. But the makers disappointed us so much in the sense that Miss Pui's character in this film was solely used for skin show. Otherwise, why was she in this film? Her name here is Kitty, for f sake, and there's a scene where Vikar says, Bro, in life you should enjoy or something, and if you want to enjoy, the camera pans to show Miss Pui in bikini playing in the water at the beach, where you really can't see her face as much as the body. <sighs> this goes on to show that the character here is used solely for the male gaze. Where you place the character as a context of male desire, essentially portraying the female body as an eye candy for heterosexual men. See, we all know that Miss Puyi was an ex OnlyFans creator, and if you want to use her in your film as a talent, go ahead, no problem. You give her what she deserves as an actor, but here you just put her to titillate the audience so that you can sell more tickets. If that was your intention, that's a Nasty. That's like setting us 50 years backwards. You know, there were so many people supporting your film. Pulau shouldn't be banned. Pulau should be given the release they deserve and whatnot. Just for you to portray something so misogynistic makes us think like, did we support the wrong cause? Was Terengganu right here? You tell me. Oh, I heard Mark Odia was also in this film. I didn't really see him. Maybe because he was used as a shadow for Haris Anwar's character where he just does the hi-fi and lo-fi and laughing beat. And then he has like two dialogues and one of it being, rest in peace, bro. Why was he in this film? 
We have no idea. Namron, playing the boat owner, acts like every other local man in every other horror film warning the newcomers to this area about the tragedy that happened in their village. The words, the tone, his expression felt so repetitive because you have seen this kind of character so many times in a lot of Malaysian and Indonesian horror films. Jadikan kisa legenda ini sebagai satu peringatan. Why was this character written the way it was written? We have no idea. And there are also other actors who I don't really remember why they were here and what they were doing and I don't know why they existed in the film also. So can you see it? How can every other character in your film has massive flaws? It's like the direction and the writing fail on so many levels. Throughout the film, through bits and pieces here and there, you're told about what happened to this ghost and what happened in this past life and whatnot, but it's not deep enough that you start caring for her. See, for horror genre, the past tragedy, the story of this past tragedy is the backbone of the film. I have seen some horror films where, you know, the past tragedy is so impactful that you start rooting for the ghost, even though the ghost is a bit cruel but you start caring for the ghost and you know because you understand what pushed the ghost to reach that extent that it became cruel but in this film it doesn't get there it doesn't reach that you just don't care about this ghost i mean you could tell the whole backstory from the trailer itself interracial marriage villagers don't agree someone killed a chinese guy and then the wife turns whatever for revenge how original i have not heard anything like this before if the makers got at least that thing right, maybe the film would have survived, but nope. I get it. No one wants to go out there and make a bad film. But this film, it's like they were set to make a bad film right from the beginning. Firstly, how dumb these characters are or how dumb they wanted the audience to be. You see, we Malaysians, right, regardless of our race and religion background, we sort of grew up to the same beliefs and practices when it comes to paranormal experience, you know, or this kind of ghost stories and stuff, right? I'm sure you grew up hearing all this kind of things where your mother or your father or anybody in your house will say things like, Hey, malam malam, jangan masuk hutan. Kalau masuk hutan, kau jangan sentuh apa-apa. Kau jangan kencing dalam hutan malam malam, eh? Kalau tengah malam, kau dengar bunyi luar rumah tu, just close your damn face, pray harder, but don't go out. You know what I mean? We grew up listening to this kind of thing, you know, our parents say thing, the teacher, you know, you are so used to this kind of stories, right? The social rules, unspoken rules or whatever. But these characters here, they see an abandoned village, which is clearly guarded with some ropes and some ornaments that, you know, like they ikat something with jumpy and whatnot, whatnot. They're like, Jo Maso! And then they touch and play with everything there and then they find this, this haunted looking village house which looks like it's going to collapse anytime and they decided to sleep inside because Alif Sata says it's better than camping, right? What?! And then there's also a scene where all the characters are sleeping and then Emilia suddenly wakes up, she experiences a paranormal thing that's happening in this house and then she hears this loud crying noise that's coming out of the jungle. So she proceeds to get out of this house alone and you know, she's genuinely looking to find something. Emilia, what do you think you're going to find there? Mowgli? See, the thing here, if these characters, right, they are like 15 to 16 year old kids, you know, who goes on a lawatan sambil blaja at this place and then they do this kind of stupid shit, you will agree you'll be like yeah they be dumb sometimes but these are grown-ups and they're old enough to die why would they make this kind of choices it's just so dumb and we also get like some really stupid cringy scenes like there's a scene where Vikar goes to Miss Puyi with a rose and then he does some magic with some Indian sounding BGM playing so loud in the background and then Mark Odia walks into the scene and then he just flex his bicep to Vikar's face what the f what is that like there's another scene of how they catch the fish. Oh, Jesus Christ. <sighs> For a supernatural horror thriller, whatever, I just had like two good jump scares. And that's pretty bad, you know, for a horror film to have only two good jump scares. Like, you know, sometimes people say like how, oh, horror film is all about the sound. They had a lot of sounds, but the visual so dumb that I was just like, you want me to be scared right now or what? In the flashback scenes though, it's very difficult for you to tell which era these people are from because, you know, sometimes, you know, the costumes and, you know, the, the set, the designs, the hair, or whatever, will sort of indicate you where, you know, when this is taking place. But here, everything looks like it's either they're from 1930s or they're from 1980s and everything in between so you can't really tell like huh what what's going on where where what finally there's this one scene where this this ghost you know back in flashback doing this black magic thing and she's surrounded with lights and you know back in that era you'll see this this lamp this lampu solo or sometimes you'll see the the wood and then you have the fire on top or sometimes you have candles but here she's surrounded by this votive candles you know as far as nyala those kind of candles. I was like, a local here in that era, in a faraway pulau, using that kind of candle, 
Okay, was it from Aeon? Did you buy everything from Aeon, the candles? And the makeup, you know the ghost here looks like it came out of Avatar The Way of Water, you know, with blue shade and smoky eyeshadow. You know what, that's all I'm gonna say, I'm tired. <laughs> The actors here, they really try to give the best they can, but with bad writing and sloppy directing, how much can they do? You know, you can see Emilia and Alif Sattar trying so hard to make this film work, but the film fails them so badly. There's only one scene where Alif Sattar talks to Emilia about his mother and how much he misses her and you know what not. That's the only scene that works in the film. Other than that, everything else was painful to watch. Here's to Amelia Henderson. I really think you're talented and I really think you're very, very pretty. If you want me to watch another 2,000 episodes of Studio Sembang, I would do it. But nothing like Pulau anymore. And to Alif Sata, why? Why did you do this film? You know, I really thought lah, okay lah, maybe this is an okay film. It's not so bad. People can still come in and watch, you know, to cringe or that whatever bit of it. But the way the film ended though, that triggered a different level of anger in me. But to simplify the ending, do you remember back in school we used to write essays, you know, like SPM essays where we write, you know, about this really uh, bad horror story and then you don't know how to end it. So to make it easy, you're like, tiba-tiba saya dengar loceng bunyi, rupa-rupanya saya mimpi. Yeah. But it's not all bad experience for me. Pulau actually helped me to set a new benchmark. So in future, if people ask me to review a horror film, I'll be like, it's better than Pulau. It's worse than Pulau. That's something, right? So on a scale of 1 to 10, Pulau is... You know there's a scene where Joey Leong says, I hope this is a bad dream. I hope we can get out of this. Joey, that's exactly how I felt watching Pulau. See you at the movies. Thank you for watching the video. If you would like to watch more reviews and podcasts and a lot more fun stuff, we are Kpo on all platforms.